Hello and good evening and welcome to Tuesday Night Live here in the Honing Block with me, O.C. Edgefor. I'm the Director of Edgefor Education and we're here to give you the confidence to try something new. How are you all tonight? How is everybody? I hope you are well. I hope you are fine. We have got an extra special show for you tonight. I'm looking, I'm so looking forward to the show tonight. Um, we have a special guest with us and we're going to be talking about all sorts of things. But tell me, how has your week been? How have things been? Are you okay? Are you somebody who's back to work already? Um, has that been going all right? Has it been strange? Have there been lots of new restrictions based on the lockdown processes, etc.? Are you somebody who has not yet gone back to work? Um, yeah, tell me how, how things have been. There are a number of people I've, I'm very happy to report that have actually found these uh, uh, sessions that I've been doing helpful. People have started new things, and I'm so happy about that. People have actually started a new venture. Uh, there are a number of people, quite a number of people who have actually found the uh, Forex sessions very helpful. Um, and thank you to all those people who support that Forex 101, which is every Thursday. Every Thursday afternoon, you can watch us back on our YouTube channel. And um, uh, certain people have actually started on a journey of actually starting to trade now in the foreign exchange markets. And I'm not sure if before the lockdown happened, before watching those videos, whether it was something they could ever see themselves doing, but I'm very happy about that. And there are others too who have actually started the wheels in motion in terms of their ideas, things that were just ideas. They have actually started to turn those ideas into a reality. They're putting pen to paper and they're actually starting to create plans. Um, and actually I'm setting up a service whereby I'm going to be able to help people formally in terms of getting ideas on paper. I've got a, pro uh, a process I'm formalizing right now whereby you'll be able to uh, have time with me and we'll go through getting your ideas onto a lean canvas and then from there I'll be able to pass you on to my network of professionals that will be able to help you develop your business idea from business strategy to um, uh, financial planning and all of that. So um, make sure that you are uh, taking action and give me some feedback as well in regards to the sessions that I'm giving. I'm hoping that they are bringing value to you. So I can see, um, uh, so yes, if you have any comments that you would like to drop in uh, tonight, please drop them in the comment section of wherever you're watching from. If you're watching from Facebook, the only way that I get to see your messages and your comments here is if you are in the honing block. If you're watching from anywhere else on uh, Facebook, unfortunately, I will not see uh, your comments. So make sure that you um, uh, type your comments from the honey block and I'll see who you are and what your comments are. If you're watching from uh, uh, YouTube, that is fine. I'll see it. If you're watching from Periscope, I'll see it. And if you're watching from in the honey block, I will see it as well. So tonight's session, are you somebody who has a brand? Are you somebody that is um, able to bring their brand to the market? No problem, no hindrance, no doubting yourself. Or are you somebody who maybe you're a bit apologetic about your brand? Maybe you're looking at the market and you're thinking, my goodness, this is an X billion dollar market. And you're thinking, I am little old me, and I'm not sure if I've got the confidence to bring this to market. Or maybe you've got a product and you know this product is sound, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, maybe there are other products out there that do exactly the same thing. Well, tonight we are going to be talking about all of those things and more because I have the pleasure of having with me um, the one and only Rachel Corson. And she is one of the co-founding uh, uh, directors of a company called Afrocentrics. And they have had an amazing journey so far. And I know this is just the beginning of their story, but we're going to talk about all of those things. We're going to help you overcome these barriers when it comes to actually positioning yourself in that market and bringing your product to the masses. So if you don't know who Rachel Corson is, I'm going to show this brief clip so that you can get to know a little bit more about her. So what other myths do you hear? Okay, so the one that bothers me the most is that Afro hair is high maintenance, mm -hmm. it's unmanageable, mm -hmm. or it's difficult to mm -hmm. look after. Mm -hmm. It's just not true, people. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I hear that all the time where people are like, I would love to wear my hair natural, but I wear wigs or mm. I just straighten it because it's easier to manage mm. that way. But I don't agree. I don't think it's easier mm. to manage in a way that it's not meant to be in. It's so. true. And uh, so I had this interesting conversation with a mum who's English and her mm. daughter has very long hair. Uh, and this mum had just always had short hair. Her mum just cut it short one day and she just lived her life with short hair. So she found her straight haired daughter's hair very difficult to maintain and manage. Because it was long. Because it was different to hers, mm -hmm. right? So what she was used to was just washing her hair, maybe putting in a bit of conditioner, wrapping it in a towel and it will be dry in half an hour going about her day. Her daughter's hair will get greasy, it will get dry at the ends, it needs to be mm -hmm. combed, it needs to be detangled. Mm -hmm. All these steps she didn't have to do. Okay, good evening, good evening, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me here, I see. Well, as good as you can be with all of the madness going on right now. Yes, of course, of course, of course. How has it been for you during this time? Uh, it's been interesting as, <laughs> you know, as a black British woman running a company that is run by black women and predominantly serves uh, black people. It's it's been heavy, it's been difficult. I've had lots of intense conversations. I'm quite emotionally and mentally drained from it all. Uh, but do you know what? It's good that we're talking about everything we're talking about, um, yeah, since all the, you know, high profile uh, police brutalities really, since, you know, I guess kicking off with uh, Breonna Taylor's murder, it's been a really intense period. Mm, yeah, it must have been. I, I wonder, how has it been for you, uh, just from a, a, a public perspective, has there kind of been an expectation of you to kind of take action or demonstrate in any specific type of way? Yeah, so I'm finding that, okay, if we're real, the business world is very white. Uh, and there's definitely, I would say, an undercurrent of anti-blackness that flows throughout it. And I think that there's been maybe, I'm not gonna go of what I think the percentages are because that would be quite controversial, but there's a chunk of people who are just anti-black and they are aware of it and they don't really care. They just think white people are better. There's a chunk of people who are anti-black but they're not aware of it. They would say, I'm not a racist, but I then come out with some you know, eugenics level nonsense. And then there are people who they're not anti-black, but they don't realise that they benefit from anti-black systems. They, they're not aware of their privilege. And then you've got a small minority who have like been allies for a while anyway. Uh, so I think what's happening now is that that third segment I mentioned, those people who are not necessarily aware of their own privilege or who aren't aware of how black people are suffering and struggling around them, um, who had never really thought much about oppression or injustice, suddenly they're waking up to the conversation and they're feeling, uh, a lot of them are feeling guilty. So I've had my inbox, my phone, my everything flooded with um, with people who either just want to understand or want to kind of alleviate their guilt or who want resources and to be pointed in the right direction or who just want to say, you know, sorry, that's what it's like for you. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a real mixed bag. And then of course, without going into it in too much detail, um, there are people in my network, um, either directly at Afrocentrics or just in my business networks, um, who are having a really challenging time right now and need a lot of support. So, in fact, uh, apologies, thanks for bearing with me, but it was a few minutes late. Um, we were doing right. last minute, last minute <laughs> Instagram live on the Afrocentrics channel because whilst it's safe and straightforward for us to talk about race, at Afrocentrics, well, we're virtual at the moment, most of the team is working with me. It's safe for us to have those conversations, but so many in our community are not in safe spaces. So many people, if they speak up, they could lose their job, or there will be, you know, there'll be some kind of repercussions. We don't think that's right. So we're trying to create those safe spaces, which is draining, but it's needed. So mm. I can't well, there's so much that we can get into when it comes to that topic. But I think yeah. naturally I've got some viewers that are watching now, but they don't know who Rachel Corsa is. They don't know the wonderful Rachel Corsa. They don't know Afrocentrics. Can you imagine? They've not possibly heard. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how what Afrocentrics is, and that will give people a bit of context as to where we are now. 
Sure. So Afrocentrics, we <laughs> Afrocentrics, we create natural hair care products for Afro and curly hair. Uh, so we sell predominantly on our website, afrocentrics.com, but we were also the first brand for black hair to be stocked in Whole Foods in the UK and in Holland and Barrett. At the start of this year, we kicked off in their clean and conscious beauty concept store up in Birmingham, which funnily enough is where we actually started Afrocentrics. So Afrocentrics began when my business partner, Joyce and I met at university. I was studying law, she was studying sociology. I had really bad eczema and alopecia because my mum had been relaxing my hair since I was three. Uh, Joyson had just gone natural and this was back in 2008. There was no natural hair scene yet. So Joyson was messing, Joyson actually used to relax my hair. She was messing around with different oils to help out with her bold spots. She gave me some for my skin. I got really excited because I wasn't allergic to it. And I asked her to start a business. Uh, she said no, even though I said I'd be a customer. Uh, so in the end, I kind of just kept bugging her, dragged her to the library. We did some research together, put in 50 pounds each to buy different oils. We made our first two products. Uh, one was a hair oil, one was a body oil. We went to a little market down in Neasden to sell them, built a really basic website. And we had a lot of customers. We had interest in the States, from the UK, from Europe, and we realized this was bigger than us. So uh, that was a while ago. <laughs> this year, actually next month, we celebrate 10 years of Afrocentrics being officially a business. So we, we've come a long way in that time. Uh, we recently raised some uh, kind of pre-seed investment. Uh, we raised a valuation of 2 million in the company. And with that money that we raised, we've been able to hire more people. Uh, so there are now eight of us full-time on payroll. So that's quite exciting. This time last year, there were just three of us. So we're fast growing. That's amazing. And uh, it's funny because uh, naturally the viewers might not know that actually our lives have crossed paths in, in, yeah. in, in history. It's, it's very ways. strange. I, I hear about things that you were doing around 2008 and I kind of have my own story. But just to tell the viewers a bit of the background. Now, I know Rachel. In fact, I knew your dad first. Really? I Wait, I didn't know that until just now. <laughs> you didn't know that? Yeah, I knew him from basketball. Okay, I used to actually play me. outdoor basketball with your father. Yeah, so, Whoa, and funny. it was very strange for me because obviously there's a few crossovers, guys. I, I won't bore I you with the whole story, you. but your husband and I used to work together, right? So we worked together. He would tell me about this new lady friend that he had, etc. And then you happened to come and work as I left that workplace, right? Mm. So strange. And then I turn up at your wedding and I see your dad. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, oh, oh. This <laughs> very, very crazy. Very small world. I love how you, yeah. said you turn up at the wedding as if you were not like them. So yeah, yeah. Like, like, I wasn't invited. I just strolled in. I just strolled <laughs> in. I just thought, you know, it smells like there's some nice food here. I'm sorry, can I say, for those people who are watching, this is no exaggeration, and I've been to many weddings before in my life, but the food at the reception of Rachel's wedding, without doubt, has to be some of the most, I have to bring my accent out, some of the most <laughs> delicious sweet meats I have tested. This is not for the vegetarian friends of mine. This is the most delicious. No, seriously, it was like... Company. It was so. It was just so fantastic. It was delicious. It was really. It's really funny. Good. I get friends asking us to do a blessing just so that we can recreate the food. Yeah, so they yeah. can eat the food again. So I'm not we the only might. one. Okay. It's yeah, yeah, it's not. It's it's common. Yeah. The food, seriously, I didn't want to leave. I did. That I didn't was like the, the bulk of our focus. It was food and music. They are the things we must get right. And so. you got them both right. You got yeah, them. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, folks, that's, that's a bit of background. So uh, Rachel, explain. You've explained how uh, it started off just as an idea, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, in this in this community, we try to what the purpose of education, the purpose of choosing our life. We're helping people turn ideas into reality. And quite often people are missing those vital key steps, right? So now you said a few things really quickly and really small. <laughs> <laughs> and I know they're big deals, like to, to be the first black hair product sold at Whole Foods, that is massive. 
I mean, can you explain to people just how big that is? I guess it's kind of a big deal. So, <laughs> so me and Jason, we quit our jobs to run Afrocentrics in uh, 2016. And when we did that, you still could not go into a mainstream store. You couldn't go to a high street store and buy anything for Afro hair. Um, if you were lucky, you could rock up to Boots or Superdrug and maybe find a relaxer kit. And that was pretty much it. So we started saying, okay, we're selling pretty well online. We've proven that there's big demand. Let's start speaking to, to retailers. Because we started early on, but they kind of laughed us out of the room. Uh, they would either presume that we were the girls that Afrocentric sent <laughs> and they'd take the company seriously, but not take us seriously. Or they would just straight up say, oh, we don't have customers of that demographic who shop here. So for us, it was several years of doors being shut in our face, of emails being ignored or receiving like rude or passive aggressive or just like quite... I would say anti-black emails uh, with people saying that they, they didn't see a need for this. And even, you know, you might be watching this and you're not black, you're thinking, how does this relate to me? Ultimately, most businesses exist to solve a problem and it will either be a problem for you in that you want financial freedom, you want to have more control of your time and your resources, or it will be a problem that you see that others have and you think, I have the service or I have the product that fixes that problem. And it might be that what you have is so innovative that people don't believe that it solves the problem and you need to kind of get some traction. So that was us. So people thought, no one really cares about this. Like, why are you guys so obsessed with natural ingredients? And no one really cares about natural ingredients. And we were looking to the US and we saw that their natural hair movement was like 20 years ahead. It wasn't until about 2010 that there was a natural hair scene in the UK. So for us, when it got to 2016, we'd quit our jobs. We we're trying to get into more retailers. And we were in small independents here and there. So like G Baldwin's in Camberwell, been fantastic. We were in there. We were in the grocery, which is in Shoreditch. We were in, you know, these really, um, what would I say? Uh, very aware brands. <laughs> we were in these shops where people recognized that there was a problem when it came to providing safe and effective products for people with Afro hair. So when we started to approach bigger retailers and they would kind of dismiss us offhand, we thought, do you know what? Let's just, let, let's go to one of the big ones and let's let's do a bit of a strange one. So we'll ignore the beauty side of the company and we'll focus on the health. And that's when we thought, let's just get a basket of products to someone at Whole Foods. And when we did that, we got a lot of advice from people we knew uh, just through the business world, various people who sold other products in Whole Foods. And we were told, you know, they won't go below X margin. If you get a meeting at all, you'll have to take these terms. And we thought, uh, we're Afrocentrics, we've always done stuff differently. So we knew that, but we thought, okay, if this is where the margin, they're going to try and bring us to this margin, we're going to start here. When we went in for our meeting after, so we delivered a basket of products, we got the meeting, we went in and um, the buyer was a white woman as most of the buyers are in beauty. And we thought, we're going to have our work cut out here explaining why Afro hair is different and unique. And often would have these conversations with buyers in beauty who would say oh we already have something for afro hair even though they had you know 12 or 13 products for blonde hair alone <laughs> they had you know 20 products for for european hair but one product for afro hair which usually was a relaxer they thought that was enough uh so we were we were prepared for the worst but actually it was it was a great conversation like we were in there ready to pitch, ready to do our, you know, our best kind of sales job. We didn't really need to do that. She was like, okay, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the commercials? And we were a bit taken aback. So we were like, oh, you seem to know a lot about industry. And she said, yes, many of our customers at Whole Foods are, are black and they don't just want to buy healthy food. It's not just about the inside. It's also what they put on their skin, what they put on their hair. And we don't have anything for Afro hair. And we think that's a problem. And I've been searching for five years and I haven't been able to find anything that complies with our standards because Whole Foods, if the rest of the industry, the standards are like maybe there in America, here, everywhere else, Whole Foods, it's like, you can't even see it. It's off the chain. They just have such high standards, which is fantastic. So uh, we, we sent products, we sent more products to try because she wanted to send them to someone on the team who was black to properly try them out. And it was all really straightforward. We got way better terms than what everyone was claiming you would get. And all of the things that people said that Whole Foods don't do, they, they did for us because they were eager to, to get us into the store. So 
for me, the lesson there was don't take other people's no's to be a no for you. You haven't gotten a no until you've been given a no. Just because other people who look like you, who have similar uh, businesses or who are in a similar scenario, get a no. It doesn't mean you will. It suggests maybe that you should prepare yourself for that no and be ready to overcome the barriers. But, you know, your, your mileage may vary, as they say. That is absolutely amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. There are so many parts of that story that I'm sure will resonate with a lot of the audience. So there's the whole, what do you do with the advice of your friends side of it? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the people who are advising you, how, how you actually mentally process that and then how that affects your preparation. Because like you said, yeah, people can say that this is how it would go, but then you haven't had that no yet. You haven't been stopped yet. So actually there's a responsibility to just do the best you can regardless of that. And there's a lot of psychology there. I think this is sometimes a sticking point for many people. Mm. You know, you have an idea, your friends tell you all the reasons why that might not work. Yeah. Um, but then you kind of have to deal with that and then push past that. I think that's great. And then actually the fact that you were expecting to have have to do all of this education, she was like, no, nope, this is great. I love yeah. that. <laughs> that's brilliant. And um, I know that beyond that, and actually you, you, you kind of got that that pitch successful on the way. Talk to us about the, the WeWorks uh, pitch because that was, that was a huge deal, right? That was a huge deal. How did you feel about yeah. that? Give people a bit of background to that as well before you explain. Okay, so background to this. So as I said, uh, Joyson and I quit our jobs in 2016 to go full-time on Afrocentrics. Oh, my neighbor's waving at me from outside. <laughs> I'm like right in my, my bay window at the front of the house because it's the only place with decent lighting so that you can see me. Anyway, so I had a baby in 2016. And because I was doing Afrocentrics, actually, funnily enough, the reason why OC and I met in education, and I still joke that my husband tricked me into working at his school so he could win me over, because we, we were definitely not an item beforehand, even though everyone at the school probably thinks I'm a liar, because I was like, I don't like him. Why is everyone saying we could date? Sorry, I love that. I love that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you guys were not even anything before you started not working? in my head. So okay. Jack had a little crush, but to me, it was just like, I didn't, he was, he was just this Welsh guy. <laughs> I love that. I love it. I love it. And Jack, I when you want, if Jack is watching it, I love this. I love it. So he actually lured you in. That is such a he smooth me. trick. That's he brilliant. Yeah. That's he brilliant. had like that whole, how long was I there? I was there two and a half terms till I had enough and I ran away. Um, but that's another story. And the reason I was there is I'd worked in the corporate. So I graduated from law and then I worked for a charity for a bit and traveled whilst doing Afrocentrics. Then I moved to London, couldn't afford Harrow where I grew up. So I was living in East London because it was the cheapest place at the time. And my business partner lived in East London. And then I worked, uh, I'd worked at Cadbury's head office while I was in Birmingham after I graduated. And then when I moved to London, I worked at Tesco head office. And <laughs> I was in the legal department during the horse meat scandal. Uh, so you can imagine what that was like, yeah. I'm busy. A story for another day. Anyway, so I hated it at Tesco. I didn't like the corporate world. I felt like this is not me. And it was also tiring because I would, I was working, I was living in East London, traveling two and a half hours to the Welling Garden City to go to Tesco head office, working in this like oppressive environment where literally it was me and one other black girl who now works for Afrocentric, so it's great. And we would get mixed up. We would only be given enough work for one person because they thought we were the same person. No. Yeah. Please yeah. no. Please I, I no. Say, that's not even the worst, but that's, as I said, a conversation for another time. So it was mad working there, but I was tired and then I would have to travel back. I lived in Leightonstone and then I would, on my way home, trek to Joycelyn's house in Hackney. We would make products to, you know, meet the orders. It would probably be like, you know, 10 products that night. It was actually ridiculous the amount of work we were doing for these small, small orders. Um, but then it was getting to the point where we couldn't keep up with it. We couldn't keep up with our jobs. And before we made the jump to, to quit our jobs, I said, OK, I can't do corporate because they want like all of your time. Um, and it's kind of meaningless. I want to do something that makes a difference. I love education. I've been tutoring for a bit. 
So I went and worked at an EBD school, so a school for children with emotional behavioural difficulties. I worked there for like two terms. I loved it. It was fantastic. One of the kids put me in hospital. The kids would frequently swear at me and bite me and throw stuff at me. But And these are primary school children. They were very, very troubled. But it was so rewarding. Like the, the impact you make on those kids, like it, it's just, it's quite beautiful. Like a lot of these kids, they haven't been looked after. They haven't been cared for. And just like, it's a weird saying, you're allowed to like hug the kids and stuff. And sometimes you have to, but it makes such a difference to them. So I absolutely loved it. And then the head teacher said to me, Rachel, you're not using your degree. Either go qualify as a teacher and come back and I'll give you a teaching job or go and do what you actually want to do. Cause why are you like wasting your life hanging around here? And I loved my job, but it was a TA job and I was there way overqualified for the role. Um, but I wasn't quite ready to find a career job because I wanted Afrocentrics to be my career, but it seemed like a lofty ambition. So at that point, I like walked into church one Friday and I said to, to my friend Jack, now my husband, oh, I need to find a new job. And he's like, oh, they're hiring at my school. He was all excited. I thought he was excited because he loved his school. Turned out that he was excited for a different reason. Uh, <laughs> right? Yes. I really didn't even think he liked me. So yeah. it's so funny. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so when, Jack, Jack was know, like, right? ah, you're looking for a job, are you? I don't oh, just to me. Yes. I have a job for you. Yeah. Even our first date, it was like, oh, do you want to go watch this basketball match? And I was like, okay. What, what <laughs> genius. Genius. I'm not going to interrupt you, will you carry on? Yeah. So um, so I'm working, I'm working there, I'm like working nights. It, it was mad. But basically, very long story short, I'm not going to go through my whole CV because I've had about 30 jobs. <laughs> but um, when I was working in education, I had a bit more freedom and flexibility because of the timings or because I was a TA, so I shouldn't have had to take work home. That school did make me take work home, which is part of the reason I left and they weren't paying me for it. Um, <laughs> but I was probably unsurprised by this. Anywho, being unpolitical about this, um, I was being paid as an unqualified TA and I was there with a law degree and, uh, and an MBQ in childcare learning and development that I did in the summer holidays of my law degree. And um, I had like years of experience working with kids. I was teaching lessons, planning lessons, marking lessons, doing interventions throughout the school. When I left, they replaced me with three teachers during my work. Um, one was a senior leader. One was like a supply teacher they had to bring in. And I was like, wow, just so that you'd pay me above the poverty line. Anyway, so I, I've had some interesting experiences. Um, and by the time me and Joyce Ling got to the point where we realized we had to quit our jobs, we were both working part-time. So I'd gone on to do a master's. I worked at UCL where I did my master's and I was advising student businesses three days a week and the rest of the week I was working on Afrocentrics and that was all well and good. But then we realized, wait a minute, we're looking around us and we're like, all these like mediocre businesses, but it's just like a white guy with a good degree. They're raising a lot of money so that they can actually hire people and grow their company. And that's when we started to learn about angel investment, and venture capital and all these things. And we started winning all these awards, which would come with little cash grants, like five grand here, five grand there. And we realized, okay, we're plugging this money into the company. And it's like, you put in money, you get out at like an exponential <laughs> amount from that. We keep putting in money, getting out a lot more, but we weren't paying ourselves. We were reinvesting the profits. And it was only in 2016 when I had my daughter and uh, we'd quit our jobs completely and we're like right we're focusing on Afrocentrics now but I had a four month old um like me and my husband had just got married and spent all our money on the food for that wedding we weren't expecting the baby she was a surprise my husband's a teacher so I actually needed to work so at that point I ended up very again very long story short I had like four jobs <laughs> I was like being paid to write blog posts I was tutoring I was working for this charity doing like some stuff from home I was doing some like search engine optimization work and then I ended up um, coordinating this um, co-working space for my old boss from UCL who'd left to do his own thing. And that was actually all great. It was a really good, I, I learned a lot in that time. And I thought, okay, I, everything I'm working on now, I believe in these courses. I'm able to bring my, my baby to work with me, which is a blessing. And I'd, I'd really prayed for that opportunity because I wasn't ready to put her in childcare. She was too much of a baby. I thought I should still be on maternity leave. She's just tiny. But I was doing all this stuff. So I say I was full time on Afrocentrics, but I wasn't because we couldn't afford to pay me yet. Right. We were we were paying one member of staff and everything else. It was either me and Joyce and working for free or it was volunteers. 
Joyson's husband works for a big um, company. So he was, you know, covering the bills and they just saved a lot for this to happen. So then in about 2017, we realized this is not sustainable. This is exhausting. And our options are raise investment or quit really. Um, so 2017, we started to learn more about investment and we were being told all sorts of nonsense, which I don't think we have time to talk about, but it was just very, very unhelpful. A lot of it borderline racist. Like there's definitely more hoops you have to jump through if you're black and a woman in this industry um, that we call the startup world. So it was quite a difficult time. And then it got to 2018. I found out I was pregnant, another surprise pregnancy. My husband's very proud of himself. And I thought, wow, we're <laughs> raising investment. I've got a visible baby bump. Like how many more barriers do we need? Um, and we, we started to like say, you know, we just have to pray. So I was praying some very specific prayers. I was praying that we'd be able to raise 350,000 pounds before my son was born. And that we... <laughs> and that would be able to hire um, hire someone so that I could actually take a maternity leave. And it was crazy because about two months before I was due, we had someone who had previously interned with us, we'd offered her a job, she'd said, yes, it was fantastic. We had about um, 200,000 pounds committed in capital from various angels and funds and things were looking really good. Uh, then it started to fall apart. <laughs> so the person who had accepted this job offer, which would have brought us to four employees, including me, but I would go on maternity leave, um, she got another offer with more pay. And she thought, she was also an EU national and because of Brexit, she just thought, you know, it's safer to take this other role because that company is going to be able to back my visa application if I need it and you guys might not. So we're still in touch with her, probably rehire her in the future. But I was stressed. I was, you know, at this point, eight months pregnant, running around doing all these pitches and, uh, no, seven months pregnant. And the person who I thought was gonna, you know, come in, work on the company, actually allow me to be able to take some maternity leave, she had disappeared. So I carried on praying this very specific prayer that seemed completely crazy, that would raise 350,000 pounds before my son's born. And then we, and I was doing all this madness. I was in all these WhatsApp groups of different like angel investors and stuff. I was going and meeting people in train stations. It all sounds very clandestine and weird. And it is, that's what raising money is like. Anyway, so I had a meeting with this one guy who then went on to become one of our investors and he was great. And he said, uh, my company, he worked in tech. My company is based in a WeWork. WeWork have all these, um, these competitions every year. You guys should apply. And at this stage, I'm there with my seven month belly, which was massive. Joyson was on holiday. So it was just me and Nadia in the office. And I was tired. I was running around doing all these pitches. I thought I can't really be bothered because we keep winning all these competitions and no money follows. And I'm actually, it's, I'm trying not to be resentful about the fact that we won so many awards. And yet people say, great pitch. One of the best pitches I've seen, but you know, I don't really understand this market. And that would be like a middle-aged, bold and white guy saying he doesn't understand the market, so he can't invest when he's got like investments in like cannabis farms and like, I don't know, tech for baby monitors. And I, why do you understand that? But you don't understand this. Anywho, so it was quite a difficult time. And then this curveball was thrown of you should apply for this competition. And I thought, you know what? We've done a crowdfunder. We've raised about £6,000 for a crowdfunding campaign. So we had a video because you had to apply with a pitch deck, a video, fill in some long application form. So I thought, okay, it's probably two hours of work. There's only two of us, we've got a lot to do. We're raising investment, we're running the company. We had at that point, you know, um, like in the high hundreds of customers and it was just the two of us, we had orders to get out. We were making the products physically with our hands. Um, I mean, we still are, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, now we have better machinery, but we, we were making these small batches of a hundred at a time and it was exhausting stuff. So because I prayed about it and I was like, God can do anything, let's go ahead. Um, we did carve out that time. Nadia edited our video from the crowdfunder to fit in with this. I chopped up our pitch deck, changed it up a bit, filled in the form. I forgot about it. I put it on our Trello board where we were tracking our investment and also where we were tracking our different competitions and things. A lot of the competitions we were just doing them to raise our profile so that hopefully investors would see us and come and talk to us. Uh, so, so yeah, just forgot about it. Then a month later, I see an email which almost just went to spam and got ignored. 
saying we were semi-finalists. And at this stage, I did a bit more research and looked into it and realized this is a really big deal. This will be great PR. No part of me thought we would win. It was, this would be great PR. So <laughs> we went over um, to the WeWork office and all these camera crews were there and it was all very glamour glamorous and bougie and a bit shocking for us. And Joyce and I did the pitch together and um, we, <laughs> We spoke, there were a few people in the room who, you know, were Oxbridge, white male, middle class, um, had already raised some investment. And we were split into two different rooms for the results. And we saw these people who we were talking to who were bragging about how great the company was, how much money they'd raised, and they went into a different room. So I was like, okay, that's the woman that lost. Uh, one of the guys from We Work Matthew came in and said, do you know what, I'm really sorry, you know, well done for getting this far, but you guys, I'm sorry to let you know you're gonna have to come back. And we all wanted to punch him. We were like, what? Ah, like it was it was an emotional moment. And um, even at that stage, I was like, fantastic. The PR from this is gonna be off the chain. They're, you know, they've got such a huge budget for press. They've got all these celebrities involved. Ashton Kutcher is judging, how cool is that? You know, I grew up watching like Punk and that 70s show and the Butterfly Effect. So that was crazy to me to begin with. Um, and then when we're told we're going to be on stage, it's this big bougie thing. I'm just there thinking, great, good PR. Hopefully there'll be some investors in the audience. And they were a bit fuzzy about what the prize money would be. Um, and they said, oh, it could be you get nothing. The money could be split. It's not really a competition. They were just very, it was very unclear. But at this stage, we had 100 grand of capital committed. Um, I was due to give birth um, <laughs> on the day of the competition. <laughs> But I knew my baby wasn't coming that day. I knew he was going to come on the Saturday, which he did. I went into labor on Saturday and was born um, Saturday night. He was born Sunday morning. But the pitch was on a Thursday. And me and Jason had a big chat about it because we both pitch. We're both able to pitch quite well. Um, we have very different skill sets in a lot of areas, but there's overlapping strengths we have. And one strength we both have is we can deliver a good pitch. I also used to teach public speaking and I was the president of debating back at my university. And one of my like weird skills that everyone always says is that I have an answer for everything. As in, I'm very good at quick Q and A on the spot. Um, and I thought, okay, if I need to have like, I watched this pitch where Ashton Kutcher was telling someone off for standing on the stage, but not knowing all the answers. And I thought, okay, if someone needs to have like an encyclopedia of the business in their brain. That is me, everyone in the team calls me the nerd. So I thought, okay, it makes sense for me to do this pitch. And then we had this big conversation where Joyce was like, I don't know if you should do the pitch because you're very visibly pregnant, and what if they discriminate against us? Which was difficult, because people had discriminated against us. We'd had a few people drop out of the um, of our investment um, opportunity because of my bump. Um, even like some women said to me, oh, we have a few reservations. Um, one of them is your high standard of ethics, because, um, you know, yeah, it's great to be sustainable, but what if there's a cheaper way to do things? Um, if you're not willing to compromise on that, we can't necessarily work for you. The other is that you're pregnant, so who's going to do the work? Huh. Anyway, so we were dealing with stuff like that. And I said, do you know what? Given the, the ethics that we work have, or at least, you know, profess to have, and given the fact that we don't really think we're going to win, this is just a PR opportunity, it's probably a good PR to have my big old bump on the stage. So let's do it. There's also the risk I could go into labour. So Joyson was ready there to jump on if she needed to. Um, and it's funny because I delivered the pitch, went to the bathroom because I was, you know, literally nine months pregnant about to drop. So I needed to go to the bathroom every 10 seconds. And it was this surreal moment where all these people were like taking pictures of me. And I was like, what is this life? Well, I'm too much of an introvert to have any interest in any of this fame stuff. And there were thousands of people in the audience and, you know, they were like kind of flocking around me. And then suddenly good old Matthew from earlier runs over to the, to the women's bathroom and is like, you need to come now. You need to get on stage. We're announcing the winners. And I was like, oh, it's all right. Joyce can do it. He's like, no, get on stage. You need to go now. So I'm being rushed on stage. They've already started to announce the winners as I'm slowly waddling onto the stage. And then they announced that the grand winner, and they announced the third person, I missed it because I wasn't on stage, the second person. And I was like, great, she deserves it, really, really happy. And I thought, mm, I knew I delivered a, a, a decent pitch. I knew that I did really well on the Q&A, which, which is more my thing. And I thought, you know, we could have gotten third or second place. We're not going to get first place. So then when Ashton Kutch is there saying, and the grand winner, 
with a price of, I think it was $350,000 is Afrocentrics. I was $360,000. I'm like, sorry, looking around, Joyson is jumping in the air celebrating. I'm there like, okay, <laughs> what's just happened? Um, so yeah, so that was on the Thursday. On the Friday, I spent, Joyson spent the whole day in the office. Our orders were popping. She spent the whole day basically in the lab making products. I spent the day in bed talking to investors, talking to lawyers. Our investors who hadn't yet signed term sheets were like, give me the term sheets. Um, and we were in a great position because there were some investors that I was uncomfortable with because they just seemed a bit icky. And we were able to say, no, you don't want your money, which is exactly where you want to be. Um, so it ended up being that we we had, how much was it we raised at that point? So we wanted to raise 350,000 pounds. And I think when we converted it and added together all the money we had, we were at like, 400,000 pounds. And then we find out that this competition is just the regional final. That actually there's a global final in LA um, and they were gonna fly us there, all expenses covered, including like a midway trip to New York, uh, which I didn't go on because my baby was like six weeks. But I did go to LA, which was mad because Quasi was, oh gosh, he was like, I think he was like, how old was he? Four months old or almost four months. I don't know what I was thinking. I look back and I'm like, Someone, someone needed to stop me because I was clearly mad. But anyway, so <laughs> we went to LA. Again, I did the pitch there, sleep deprived, like breastfeeding baby backstage. I was literally falling asleep on the stage. Um, I actually flopped the pitch. I, I, me and Joyce had like a little argument beforehand because she wanted me to change some of it. I was like, if I change it, I'll forget it. I did change it and I did forget it. So we both learned a lot. Um, oh, and my headphones fell out as I was walking up to the bit where you stand in front of like P. Diddy and Ashton Kutcher and Gary Vee and Kristen Green, you know, celebrity panel of judges. My um, my earphone fell out. I couldn't find the bit on the stage I was meant to stand on. It was, I think, about 3 a.m. UK time. I was exhausted. I'd been up all night feeding a baby. My baby was backstage with my friend who was looking after him. Everything was just like, what on earth is this? What is even going on? did the pitch, I said the first bit, my mind went blank and I just kept talking, but I don't even know what I said. I haven't watched it back because it's so cringe, but I forgot the pitch that I practiced. It was 60 seconds, super pressurized, all this light on me, like I think over 10,000 people watching in the room, plus more online, because it was a live stream. And I fluffed the pitch. However, again, I did well on the Q&A. <laughs> so the Q&A, I was told afterwards that um, the, one of the you know senior, well, well, the founder of WeWork was in the back deciding how much time everyone has for Q&A. And the average time I think was everyone got eight minutes, but with us, he allowed us to have 12 minutes. Every time they're like, cut it, he's like, no, let her keep talking. So we ended up having, as you can see, I talk a lot. Uh, we ended up having like this back and forth of Diddy who was like, tell me about the kitchen. And we're like, wanted to know about the heart and soul of the company. Um, and then we didn't come first, um, but to be honest, I hadn't expected to win any money. And we walked away with another $180,000. So in total, we'd raised, um, I think we raised over $630,000, including turning down quite a bit of money. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was quite an incredible experience for our first serious investment round. We'd had like a tiny bit of angel funding before that from uh, just a great group of these, um, these black guys who worked in the city, thought let's pool our money, let's help some young entrepreneurs. And um, some of them are still like a little bit involved in the background, uh, but this was our first kind of serious investment round. And I feel like God took my prayer and just did some madness with it because I, you know, no one really raised an investment like that. So it was a bit of a strange experience. Uh, we're about to open another investment round, which will probably be a bit more straightforward. But yeah, that's the long short story. I wrote a medium post on our investment story actually, which. I can send to you to share with anyone. Yes, fantastic. And I'll definitely share that in the comments underneath this. That is an amazing, amazing story. My Thanks. goodness. I mean, <laughs> the, it was the, crazy. I think that what, what I love about that um, most is just the, 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 the lack of polish. Like the, the uh, you know, when, when people hear about, cause <clears throat> Anybody who does a research, they will look online, they'll see Afrocentrics, they raised over $650,000 in seed fund, you know, and that's amazing. But to hear the story behind it, actually, it really wasn't perfect. 
because the reason why I emphasize that is because a lot of people that I, I talk to, a lot of people that I try to help, they really do feel that until things are perfect, they really can't do anything, right? Yeah. You, you have to wait until it's all put together. The pregnancy in your case would have been an excuse for someone to say, actually, now is not the right time. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you went ahead. You said that it was a bit crazy, <laughs> but yeah. in the end, it, it paid off, right? Definitely, because now for the first time in my life, <laughs> my main gig is Afrocentrics, and that's never happened before. Even even up to the point when I was doing the pitch, people didn't know I had a day job. <laughs> like I had a, I had another job I was doing, um, and I was still tutoring. I was still doing all these other things just to, you know, um, to to cover help cover our bills really. Um, so yeah, like having two children comes with its costs and. Mm. The company was all the money we were making was being reinvested into the company, and because we realised we can't carry on just running like blood, sweat, and tears is not on the balance sheet here. <laughs> we need to actually do this properly if we're going to do this, and because yeah, we've got these big, paid. hot like, global you ambitions, paid, right? So you exactly, can yes. just keep plugging it into the business and focus, running yourself right? into the ground, or you need to actually get paid for it. So yeah, it's not that, sustainable until you are paying yourself. This is it. This is it, and and that is that's a really key takeaway for anybody who's watching this. I think that's amazing. I'd like to go back a little bit, just for for our viewers. I'd like to go back to the conceptual stage of this project because we know about Afrocentrics. We see the the name, we see the label. The product is there for all to see. How did you come to that? How did you first of all come up with the name? And then just the idea of the product is so that we're laughing. This is going to be good. Okay. <laughs> so, because what I'd like, you know, obviously the title today is kind of know your niche and grow your brand. So you, you clearly had a specific um, target audience that clearly separated you from everyone else. And there was nothing existing out there already. So that's very helpful, I think. Yeah. In some ways, I guess it's quite scary. But mm. you, you've got no kind of successful comparison to make. Uh, but also it's kind of like, okay, so there's not really any competition per se. Uh, yeah, I mean, there kind of was. So uh, it's rare that you do anything and there's no competition in this world. Like, yeah. uh, If you've seen a problem and you're trying to solve it, other people would have seen that problem and tried to solve it. Any idea you have that's original, probably 50 other people have thought of it. If it's a really rare idea, if not, mm -hmm. you're talking thousands, maybe millions of people have your idea. So it, it's always about the execution, right? And and for us, there was so, okay, so 2008, we started like messing around with stuff. Uh, 2009, we started taking it a bit more seriously. 2010, we won an award from the University of Birmingham for ethical and sustainable business innovation. Again, just entered on a whim thinking, oh, maybe we can get onto the university newsletter and get a few more customers. And it was, strange that not only did we win some money but they said if you register the business and take this seriously we're going to give you some more money and some more support um so we did so we registered the business july 2010 and at that stage the competition i was aware of was a company called hair we grow natural who made butters i don't think they're still going but really like impressive woman behind it and we reached out to her and we thought you know what like we don't really believe in monopolies and we're solving the same problems here so let's work together so we started doing like really small scale like natural hair events i think we did one or two in birmingham it was mainly in the midlands because we were still university students living in birmingham and there, there was nothing happening like you know the natural hair beauty expos of tens and thousands of attendees in the us nothing like that was happening in the uk there, there wasn't that much of a market most people were still relaxing their hair uh so when we started, the reason we called it Afrocentrics, to be honest, was I came up with a silly suggestion. You know, it's kind of Afrocentric, because <laughs> me and Joyce have never always been quite, you know, for the people pro-black. Um, so I said, you know, we're kind of Afrocentric. We like the culture. We want to promote the culture. We are girls. We are chicks. Afrocentrics. And Joyce said, that's an awful name. That's really stupid. We're not going with that. I checked the domain. It was 99p. I said, do you have a better idea? She said, no. I was like, cool. Afrocentrics it is. So that was our first website. And I said, you know, we can change it later. It's cool. And it's funny because we got so much flack from people who said, sounds a bit too black. Isn't that going to be off-putting? You know, there's not that many black people in this country. 
um, why don't you do stuff for everybody? And we said, well, there's loads of stuff out there for everybody. We didn't start just to make products. We started to fix a specific problem, which is that you can't really get safe products for Afro hair that actually work. Most products for us, they're toxic and they're rubbish, which is why black women and black men too end up being product junkies, where we've got 20, 30 different bottles that we've tried once or twice just on the mantelpiece, on our dresser. Um, when we do find something that's moderate, but maybe it smells really bad or it leaves a grease stain wherever we go, we just think, oh, best of a bad bunch. And you start to feel like you are the problem because it will say for dry damaged hair or for problem hair um, or for coarse hair, uh, it, like it never, you get products that say for normal hair and then you get products for coarse hair. And it's like that whole language is that, um, you know, othering of, of people with afro and curly hair the way that you're treated like there's something wrong with you and we wanted to say no there's nothing wrong with us we just have different needs there's just something wrong with the products so we we started off with the same afrocentrics and over the years it just kind of grew on us you know we built a brand around it people quite liked it it's not the best branding wide afrocentrics you know four syllables bit of a mouthful everyone pronounces it wrong like if i had a pound for every time people called it afrochenics <laughs> or Afro, like uh, all these other names we get, right? It happens often, but it kind of doesn't really matter because to us, it was, we're solving a problem. We didn't really know where we'd go. We couldn't really even envisage that we'd be, you know, running company that's winning all these awards that is um, pitching to, you know, P. Diddy and Ashton Kutcher and like winning money, hiring black women. You know, we, we didn't think we'd be able to innovate on a product level in the lab in the way that we have. But when you start off on an idea, you never know the path it's going to take you on. I think the important thing is that you're clear on what you're trying to achieve. So for us, we just wanted people with Afro hair, people like us, to be able to get safe, effective products. And it's taken us on this strange path. And here we are. I don't know if I even answered your question because I'm quite tired. So yes. kind of wrapping up. <laughs> I think you Mom did. The, the question was around um, how you came up with the name and just okay. the product development. So yes, you did, yes, you did. Okay. And I, I think one one, of the, one interesting thing I find, actually I do the research around the people I'm interviewing, I love the fact that you've got the educational branch as well. Now, yeah. I, I want you to tell us just very briefly about trichology, okay? Because okay. I, I, I had never heard of that before, yeah. right? So, and if you go into a, I don't know, a dinner party and say, hey, look, I've studied trichology, you know, I'm quite sure people might say okay that's great and just carry on so explain to us what that is and just how key it is in terms of this product and everything you do around afrocentrics yeah okay so afrocentrics has always been a kind of science and data backed company in that we always looked at what problems were then we'd read research papers we'd um <laughs> we'd go on mintel and look and see that their research for black hair was based on the sample size of 30 women. So we'd go outside like the Afro Hair and Beauty Show with our clipboard and just do our own research and speak to maybe like 100 women and think, wow, we beat Mintel, so we're doing something. Um, and then like eventually we, we up that so now in our research we can involve hundreds or uh, in our most recent research, thousands of women. Um, and we, we always base it on science. We've always worked with scientists. Um, as I said, we're studying humanities. Me, Law, Joyce, and Psych, uh, sociology uh, I had done a biology chemistry and maths uh, set of a level I also did humanities I don't know why I did six a levels but here we are anywho so this is meant to be a brief answer and I'm rambling about my a levels back to trichology the reason we studied well I studied trichology Joyce and did a soap making course afterwards is because we thought people are just making stuff up in, in this, this area there wasn't much of a natural hair movement but there were all sorts of self-professed beauty and hair gurus who were just saying, oh, if you pour some onion juice on your hair, it will grow 18 inches overnight. And we thought, okay, let's just be a company that, yes, we're natural, but we always come with a scientific approach because a lot of poisons are natural, right? A lot of molds are natural. Being natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. So for it to be safe, you have to be science-based and natural. So when we learned about trichology, uh, kind of through one of our investors, um, an angel investor about a year after we started, and a girl who used to kind of be part of the company and then left um, to pursue a different career. Um, she had kind of joined us after a year, told us about trichology, uh, 
you know, linked us up with these ambassadors who she'd met through, I think it was like the Windsor Fellowship. And then we parted ways. But once we learned about trichology, which is the science of the scalp and hair, it's essentially super specialized dermatology. We thought, got to study that. So yeah, so I studied at the Institute of Trichologists in London, really, really enjoyed it. Even when I did my master's later, I did a, an MSc. And for my research project, not my main one, not like my, for my thesis, I went to the University of Cambridge and did some stuff in like neuroscience. But for my, um, uh, like I had a, a research project I could do myself, I did it looking at trichology and looking at the way that uh, there is almost like a medical triage that happens through trichology uh, because of the way that hair is so important for people, uh, for most black people, essentially. So I could talk for ages about that, but I won't. Trichology is the science of the scalp and hair. That's amazing. And, and uh, I think that what, again, I think I find useful in that is that, you know, a lot of people, again, kind of going back to this idea of you have to have everything ready straight away. But from your story, it's, it's evident that you've learned so much as you've gone along. So I think the key message here to people is just start. You know, yeah, your, your, your brand name, it started off as a joke <laughs> and actually you thought, right, let's just start with this mm -hmm. and you could always change it as time goes on. But I think the key yeah. here is you're taking action, you're doing it, you don't know everything, you're learning as you go. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. Thank really you. Yeah, that's life right. lifelong learning is really important in business. I think you have to be humble and recognize that so you always have to be learning because there's always something new. Well, I'd, I'd like to, um, what I will do is if you're watching this and you would like to ask Rachel a question, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to write down your question, type it in the comment section, and I will pose it to Rachel. Rachel, I have one more question for you just before we round up everything, bring it into the uh, uh, audience. Um, I want to know just in terms of this whole idea of bringing a product from concept mm. to the market you're now being paid by that business, which is excellent. There's so many people who want to get to that place. What is the most difficult thing that you've experienced in that journey? And how did you overcome it? What, what, what did you learn from that difficult experience? That's a big question. <laughs> so I think that there are so many fantastic ideas out there. There are so many people making like really amazing products just for themselves and their families and wanting to turn it into a business a lot of the time is a great idea um i love the prototyping part i really like inventing i don't like scaling it up so i don't like taking something that works fantastically when you make a bank but like a batch of uh, i don't know 10 10 hair butters or 10 shampoos and it works well but then you have to make sure you can make a thousand and you have to make sure it's still stable as formula if you make ten thousand um so that part is a bit of chemistry that my brain checks out. Uh, so the hard part for us was kind of um, creating really clear research and development processes and then deciding, okay, if we don't have the passion for this part where you're like scaling up your uh, formulation, let's sketch out the process and then let's hire in the talent for that. So the way we decided to do that was with internships. So we're about to start our third research and development internship. Uh, where we have someone who's studying cosmetic science or chemistry and they come and work with us. We teach them everything about running a product company and they get to do their own project and actually help to bring something to market, which is an incredible opportunity you usually don't get as a student. So it's kind of win-win. They get fantastic uh, education. We get help with kind of like, you know, the scaling side and, and you know, you do the mentoring and it's rewarding um, on both sides. So I think the hardest thing, it, at first it was probably complying with all the new EU legislation that came in around 2012, just because it was so expensive, you know, uh, for every single product. It can cost you thousands of pounds just to get a product close to the point of being able to comply legally. And then you have to register them on the EU portal. There are all these things that people don't know. Um, but yeah, it's a very involved process to bring a product to market and that probably needs a whole other you know, hour on a podcast to talk about that. But um, it's something I, you know, let me know if you guys want to want to see us talk about that on our YouTube, we can make a video about that. We do need to talk a bit more about that to empower people 
to make that change. Someone who talks about this a lot, actually. So I'm wearing a lipstick from MDM Flow, I think, it's in my pocket. MDM Flow, so Florence, who runs MDM Flow, she studied cosmetic science and she's fantastic. She talks a lot about the process of formulating products, taking it from an idea to a reality. Um, she's a young black British woman, she's Nigerian really really impressive and i would advise checking her out if you're looking for those resources if you want to know more about hair then ask me me and joyce are passionate about you know widening the industry we think there are so many barriers to entry and now that we've jumped over a lot of those we kind of just want to like you know smash through the glass ceiling and throw down a ladder so let, let us know if we can help you thank you so much do, do you know what not just did you answer the question not just did you promote your youtube channel but you've also <laughs> shouted out somebody's product you, which you just happen to have in your pod I in do. your pocket and like about. almost like a jedi master just slipped it on to your <laughs> onto your lips without even without even a second thought the color was reapplied it. i mean come on now That's i so didn't want to like misrepresent and her fantastic products. I just have chronically dry lips because I have eczema, so uh, lipstick doesn't stay for long, but her products are really good. It's, uh, that's some serious skills. Serious skills. <laughs> serious skills. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we, have, we have a comment that's come through. We're going to have to wrap it up. We're, we're going slightly over time, but the story has been so amazing. We had uh, comments from online uh, from Facebook. It's always said, come on. I, I know the tone that that is said. Come on. We got uh, Paul Morris to say an incredible story. We have this, this comment here that's come in. It says, hi, Rachel. What an incredible story. Can I arrange my 14-year-old daughter to spend a day in the life with you after lockdown. My daughter is passionate about this subject. Yes, but we, in fact, we've had a lot of that. We, we've had probably uh, four, um, about 12 work, between work experience and young interns, we, we've had probably uh, 12 people who've kind of come through. And we get sometimes people com contact us on Instagram and say, love what you're doing, can I come and like, do some volunteering for you. And yes, we'd love to give people that experience. I wish I had that when I was a teenager. Um, so yes, but because she's 14, you'll have to be there with her. We'll have someone over 18 who is like the responsible adult because she's a minor. But yeah, we'd love to. Um, our office gets a bit wild. Sometimes I have my one-year-old there. Um, it's like a playpen, in the, like a ball pit in the corner. Uh, so so be, be prepared. And it's like uh, our, our space, it's an office, but it's mainly kind of for manufacturing. And then there's a bit for like photography and video shoots. So it's it's a bit zany and out there. So prepare yourself. But yeah, drop me um, drop me a line on Twitter, if you're on Twitter. Not on LinkedIn, because it takes me like two years to respond to those. <laughs> LinkedIn, I'm so bad. And I'm really bad on email. But the best thing is to email info at afrocentrics.com. I'm not, I'm not very quick to respond to emails. I've got two young kids. I just, I choose not to be on top of my email inbox so that I can be there for my kids and uh, be there for my team. But info at afrocentrics.com is checked several times a day. Our whole team of eight people manage their inbox and someone will get back to you and make sure that I actually see it. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to have your daughter come and learn some things. And the, the person's replied, you said yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So that's a happy customer. And, and I have to verify what you've just said in terms of getting back to the email because I would, you know, it's it's not often, you know, I've had some big people that I've interviewed here. I have some okay. big people I've interviewed. You will have to be the first person who I've used an intermediary to communicate with. So that's like, you, you, yeah, you're, rolling. you're rolling. You I'm know, so what I'm dealing with people secretaries, that's like, yeah. <laughs> the reason I have a PA, it's a bit cringe, right? But I don't know if you've read the book Deep Work by Cal Newport. So Sorry? Jack got me to read Deep Work, a book by Cal Newport. Uh, no, it I changed my life. Anyway, oh. I recently wrote a Medium article um, about time optimization, and I explained why I'm, I'm just not on top of my email. I'm not an inbox zero person, and I choose not to be, because when I was, I spent so much, I could spend hours of my day on emails. Like, I, li I kid you not, I currently have 4,000 emails in my inbox that I haven't read. I get, every time someone on my team, every time I have like a new hire or an intern, and they're like, oh, I sent you an email. I'm like, come come stand with me for five minutes. And I show them my screen and the ping, 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 ping. I'm like, in this meeting, look how many emails there are. And it's not because I'm like some big person. It's not that at all. It's just that 
the nature of our industry is that we're serving people who have been underserved for so long mm. that there and also there aren't that many black weirdly black hair is this massive industry but there are very few black women who own companies in the black hair industry which is mad we're the biggest customers we don't really have the ownership so i'm forever getting you know journalists pr like people kind of wanting sound bites i just get a lot of emails and it, i i used to be doing my emails like kind of while I'm breastfeeding or whatever and I realized I just want to spend more time with my kids there's only so much I can do yeah. in a day I want to get deep work done so yeah so so don't take it no, that's cool, like that's cool. you're I'm not a big wig I'll idea. still keep that story in my head that you are a big wig but the official story has been <laughs> no. told now in this video so that, that's we'll roll with that we'll roll <laughs> I'm just no, that's good Rachel from the block <laughs> That's fine. So, guys, listen, have a look there. I'm trying to get my finger in the right place. Have a look at the scrolling bell at the bottom. If you'd like to get in touch with Rachel, we have somebody who said Twitter is good. So that's why yeah. I think I'm sure somebody I'm will be... I'm very responsive on Twitter. There you go. Okay, so uh, come, uh, contact you via there. Someone's asking, this will be the last one, have you considered opening a hair salon? Uh, the short answer is yes. We even named it um, the Afrocentrics Main Emporium which would be tame for short. And we had all these ideas where, you know, rather than hairdressers, we'd have hair care artists. So the focus is on the health of your hair and then they're like an artist to make it look nice. Um, but when we looked at the business models and the logistics and cash flow and everything, we realized that for our big global ambitions of like making sure that every single person in the world with Afro and curly hair can access our safe, effective products. If we suddenly have overheads of a salon, uh, that could kind of, a lot of what we're going to do so in future we'd love to have a flagship and we'd love to train up other stylists there's a few trichologists and hairstylists we're working with and that is something we'd love to do in future but right now we can't because you can't do everything you kind of have to pick your lane and do well and then you can be like nike and just have fingers in every pie eventually fantastic oh goodness me well thank you so much rachel for joining us tonight um, don't get anywhere. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you in a minute, but we're, we're going to have to say goodbye to the viewers who who, who are watching you. Um, but again, your story is so powerful. I know we've only scratched the surface of certain of the details, but I really appreciate everything that you've shared. But um, everybody say thank you to Rachel and contact her. Contact her via these links below and just stay in touch, support her brand, and um, yeah, follow what they're doing. And also some of the um, blogs that you've written as well on the YouTube channel. I forgot to shout that out. So have a look at the YouTube channel, Afrocentric's YouTube channel, and some of Rachel's blogs. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thank you. And thanks, guys. Sorry, say that again? I'll just cut you I'm off. Thank you, everyone, for the questions and comments. <laughs> great stuff, great. Thanks for thank listening. You. Oh my goodness me, goodness me, goodness me, goodness me. Have you enjoyed tonight's show? I hope you have because, you know, I, I, again, Enjoy Education, we are here to help you have the confidence to start something new. Are you somebody who is now inspired because of Rachel's story? Are you somebody who is thinking, right, okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to go ahead with this and make it happen. I hope you are. If you have any testimonials of watching any of our content and it has helped you to develop, please send us a message, send us a comment. we love to know who the people are that we're helping. I would like to close as usual, just to say uh, that we have our live competition. I was gonna put up this image here. So we have our competition is live on our website, www.edgewayedu.com. And we are giving away another 20 pound Amazon gift voucher courtesy of Ame Finance. Academy, and I would like to say also congratulations to Steve Sennery, who is from the US, who won last week's competition. So, if you'd like to enter this week's competition, go to our website and click um, the competition tab. The banner is there at the bottom, you can see that, and you can enter there. Okay, my goodness me, guys have you enjoyed the session i hope you have we have got an exciting session again this thursday do not miss it we've got forex 101 i'm going to be teaching another lesson on how to make money in the foreign exchange 
markets. I will be joined by a special guest from the US, Mr. Kevin Serrano, who is a uh, Forex educator. We're going to pick his brain, ask him questions as well. And then, of course, next week for Tuesday Night Live, I have none other than Kike Onewinde, who is the founder of BYP Network. If you do not know, Google search and find out. And we're going to be talking about the power of growing your network. Join us next week here in the Honey Block. Take care. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next time.